Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In chapter 6 of book 4, Epictetus talks through a reasoning process with a person who is upset at being pitied, at other people having compassion for what they take to be that person's bad state or, or unfortunate condition. He has a lot of really interesting things to say here about pity itself or compassion. The Greek word that he's using here, the verb is ele eleistai. Um, eleos is the Greek noun, and it can mean either pity or compassion. It's, 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 it's some sort of affective reaction towards the other who is perceived as suffering or in a bad state or in pain, any of these sorts of things, right? And this is something that Epictetus in fact, says that we ought to feel towards those who are doing poorly. For example, uh, instead of becoming angry at people who do stupid things or who misbehave, we ought to really feel pity. Why? Because the reason why they're behaving in the way that they do is because they're so fundamentally screwed up in their views on what is good for them and what is bad for them, what is right and wrong, how they should be behaving, that they do the things that they do. So instead of getting angry and, and uh, wanting to you know, revenge ourselves upon them, he says we should feel pity. And this is looked at by, by many people as a sign of some sort of good character. Now, a lot depends <clears throat> on what it is that we are pitying people for, or what it is that we are regarding as some sort of evil which has befallen them, which they have to endure, which they are living through, and which we might want to, if not just sympathize with them, even uh, to, to alleviate in some way, or to, to bewail along with them. So, here's the key question. Should we allow being pitied by others to upset us? Epictetus is dealing with a person who says, I am annoyed at being pitied. And the first things that Epictetus asks him is, well, whose action is it? Is it your action that's, that's the pitying, or is it their action? And, uh, you know, he says, again, let's think about it in another way. Is it in your power to stop it? It's not in our power how other people feel towards us, whether they get angry, whether they are sad at our condition, whether they're happy, whether they're envious. All of that is not in our control. That is their business, not really our business. It's not within our power, Epictetus would say. So already from a Stoic perspective, you know, the guy should be recognizing that if this is somebody else's business, it's not something that he has to worry about so much. But then, you know, here's what he, what he says. Um, I can show them I do not deserve their pity. Why is he so bothered? Because he thinks that he doesn't deserve their pity. Maybe, in fact, he doesn't, although we're going to see there's a paradox involved a little bit later. Um, and we can think of all sorts of cases where people are being pitied, and there's, there's kind of a looking down on the other person involved, in being uh, compassionate or pitying them. Um, this could take all sorts of different modes. You know, think about, well, here's a great example. The student who is taking out, um, you know, loans and going to school, um, studying something that's not immediately profitable, that their family can't quite understand, because they, they have a real genuine desire, perhaps even a talent for that sort of thing. And their family are like, boy, that, that poor fool, 
I don't know what's going to become of them. Look, not like their successful brother or sister over here, the one who, you know, we can look at and say, this guy or this, this girl has got it put together. Here's the historian, here's the philosopher, here's the English major, here, you know, even worse, here's the, what's going to be a starving artist, right? Uh, people will have a sense of, of pity about that. Or think about, for example, uh, disability. When somebody has a disability of whatever sort, whether it's mental or physical, other people look at them and, and it, you know, if they're not making fun of them, which is not a nice thing to do, they're saying things like, oh, I'm sorry that that's befallen you. And we can go through all sorts of examples like that. Um, when somebody gives uh, alms to another person because they're poor, they're doing so because they see the poverty as a bad thing. Um, maybe there are some, some cases in which we actually should have the response of pity towards another person. But this person really wants to assert, I don't deserve pity. I'm okay. I, I, I want them to recognize that I'm okay. I think this is a, a, a thing that we can all relate to as well. This is a common human experience. So Epictetus asks him, is deserving or not deserving pity in our control? That is in our control. Whether we genuinely deserve to be pitied or don't deserve to be pitied, that is up to us because we have control over that aspect of our life at least, if we're understanding it in a stoic way. Now here's the, the follow-up. Is being considered to be deserving of pity in our control or not? No, that is not in our control because that is up to other people. If we think that poverty is not in itself a bad thing, but they think that poverty is indeed a bad thing, mistakenly, and we happen to be impoverished, they are going to feel pity towards us because they believe that we deserve pity. If, um, you know, we get to be old and, and uh, we think that old age is not a particularly bad thing, if we're lucky enough to get old, right? Um, and other people look at old age and they say, oh man, I, I, that's a terrible thing. And then they treat us nice as a result uh, because they feel a sense of compassion towards us. We don't control that. We don't control what other people think of as deserving pity. So, you know, that is, that is up to them, as Epictetus is going to say. Um, so what, what comes from that? Uh, he says... These people do not pity me for what would deserve pity, if anything does, that is my mistakes, <clears throat> but for poverty and not holding office and things like disease and death and the like. Now, how could we remedy this? If this really is a problem, Epictetus says, there is a solution to that. Let's look at what the solution would be. If one really wants not to be pitied by other people for what considers to be the wrong things, then you got a couple choices. What are the choices? Well, convince them that they are that the things that they think are bad aren't really bad. Convince them that poverty, convince them that disease, convince them that uh, not holding office, not not getting promoted, not uh, you know having a successful romance, all all these sorts of things that we could talk about, not going on vacation twice a year, that these are not really bad things. So go ahead and convince people of that, or Here's another possibility, make, you know, make sure that you keep up appearances. If they think that being rich is a great thing, get yourself rich, then they won't be pitying you. If they think that it's really important to have an attractive spouse or boyfriend or girlfriend, go start dating, find yourself somebody like that. Um, you know, we could go on, if they think that having a good office and uh, getting promoted every so often and getting Christmas bonuses is where it's at, go do that. If you don't want them to pity you and that really, really matters to you, then you have those two choices. Now, how is this going to pan out? Epictetus wants us to see that these are not really answers. The first one, convincing the multitude. He says, um, you're trying to accomplish the very thing which God himself has been unable to accomplish to convince all people of what things are good and what are evil. Um, now, has that been given to you? No. 
Uh, only this has been given to you to convince yourself, and you're not even done with that yet. So don't even think about trying to convince everybody else about what's genuinely good and evil when you yourself are a bit mixed up about it. So that option isn't going to work. What about the appear to them to have all the goods that they think are, are great, to not have the bad things, right? Um, How is that going to work? He says, um, here we go. Are you prepared to show yourself off to them as a rich man and an official? Those are, you know, just two things you need to do. He doesn't say anything about getting yourself some eye candy to drag along with you, or about having lots and lots of friends, or about naming uh, university buildings after yourself, or any of the other things that people might throw in, right? He says, um, of these alternatives, the second is the part of a braggart and a tasteless and a worthless person. Um, besides, observe the means by which you must achieve your pretense. You're going to have to borrow some servants and possess a few pieces of silver plate and exhibit these same pieces conspicuously and frequently if you can and try not to let people know that they are the same and possess contemptible bright clothes and all other kinds of finery and show yourself off as the one who is honored by the most distinguished persons try to dine with them or at least make people think that you dine with them and resort to base arts in the treatment of your person so as to appear more shapely and of gentler birth than you actually are all these contrivances you must adopt if you want to take this second alternative to avoid pity. In our own day, we might say, all right, you don't want to uh, feel, you don't want anyone to have pity for you? Get some credit cards, start, you know, buying some stuff, make sure everybody, you know, thinks that you really have it together, hit the gym a lot, um, if you can't really take the weight off, man, some liposuction will take care of that. Do whatever you need to do in order to appear successful, to appeal, to appear as if you really have all the goods that comprise what the, the many uh, think to be a good life. Now, can, can, can the average person do that? Probably not. And there are great stories told about people who crash and burn trying to do precisely that. Um, Sometimes a person may be able to pull it off, but what are you sacrificing by doing that? You can't actually work on yourself. And we do find people um, who have devoted themselves to that sort of external success of the body, of external possessions, of, of you know, social relationships, um, prestige, who are extremely unhappy and don't really understand themselves. And then, you know, they go into therapy or counseling or, you know, one form of, of uh, working upon themselves. And they discover that they made the wrong choice. Neither of these are the right choice. So what is the possibility? Don't get upset about people pitying you. Pity isn't in itself a bad thing. Do you think it's a good thing when you do it for other people? Sure. Otherwise, you wouldn't do it. So why are you so upset when people do it with you? And there's a paradox of being upset by pity that Epictetus is going to call our attention to. So let me walk you through this, this interesting paradox. He says, Don't you see what you're saying about yourself? What sort of person are you in your own eyes? What sort of a person in thinking, desiring, avoiding, in choice, preparation, design, and all the other activities of human beings? You are concerned whether the rest of human beings pity you. And they said, yeah, but I don't deserve to be pitied. And so what does that mean? You're pained at being pitied, right? Of being, uh, pain, of being viewed as worthy of pity. Now, is the guy who is suffering worthy of pity? You see where this is going, don't you? Um, by the very emotion, he says, by which you, that you feel concerning pity, you make yourself worthy of pity. So there's a paradox. By allowing oneself to be upset over being pitied because other people think that you deserve to be pitied, even if you don't, you now deserve to be pitied. So if that's going to upset you, you're definitely going to be upset. How should we approach this then? 
uh, again, we should look at pity as something which we can feel towards other people, and other people can feel towards us, and it's not hurting us in any way if they do. If they're getting things wrong, if they think that we deserve pity because we're not rich, we're not famous, our business ventures are not taking off like gangbusters, our you know, spouse is not a, a supermodel or, or you know, a super successful whatever, that doesn't matter. Those, if people want to pity us for those, let them. That's their affair, not ours, not something that is worth allowing ourselves to become upset over. If we do want to become upset over that, then we actually do deserve pity.